practice. Let me return to the example of me jogging by the people below the overpass who are freezing. And some people might say, in fact, I suspect a plurality and maybe even a majority in the room, in a majority of the crowd here assembled, they would say, why is he just talking about giving his winter coat? That's not very generous of him, or some of you might say, that's not very Christian of him. He deserves the person underneath the overpass. He or they, they deserve a roof over their head. And as it happens, this guy Finkelstein, he does have room in his apartment for those Mexican workers and a room over their a roof over their head. I certainly have enough room in my living room for one of them. That's for sure. And morally, I have to acknowledge I'm not going to pretend to otherwise, morally, I do think the right thing, the right thing to do is to give that person space in my apartment. That's true. Morally, it is the right thing. And believe me, I'm not pretending to be a saint. I'm just speaking frankly. It does tear me inside because I know it's the right thing, but I'm not ready to do it. I'm not. I'm ready to give my winter coat. I'm not ready to give a room in my apartment. And politics is about not what is morally right because I think Jesus not that I he's my uh, but as an expression Jesus would say give your room that's the morally right thing but I'm not ready to do it and politics is about in the Gandhian sense politics is about what people are ready to do not what you think they should do. The moment when you start setting your goals, and as I said, that's the next logical stage in the movement, the moment you overreach what the public is ready to do, you, you reduce yourself from a movement to a cult. And that, I think, is the big danger always in politics. To not overreach what the public is ready for. And to stay part of the movement and not reduce yourself to a cult. Now, that doesn't mean, and by the way, not reduce yourself, which is the worst form of the cult, not to reduce yourself I have to get off? No, no. Yeah. Can, we, can we open up for some questions? Yeah. Not reduce yourself to a holier-than-thou cult, because those are the most repellent of all, in my opinion. And uh, I was asked now to open it up for questions, and actually that's where I wanted to leave it off. That's something I think one can learn from Gandhi. Thank you. Let me see some questions. Mic check. My question is. is My question how is. How important. How important. Do you think. Do you think. The upcoming vote. The upcoming vote. On the peaceful settlement. On the peaceful settlement. Of the question of Palestine. Uh, of the question of Palestine. At the United Nations General Assembly. At the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, I'm not sure you'll correct me. 
Uh, do we need to repeat here? Or because I thought this was working fine without the repetition, it just squanders time. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, the question that was put to me was, how important is the vote that's coming up in the General Assembly? Uh, actually, um, my co-author, Moeen, will be speaking about this, that this evening. I would simply answer that everything is important if you do something about it, it's unimportant if nothing is done with it. There are thousands of resolutions in the United Nations General Assembly that litter the United Nations General Assembly on Palestine. The problem is not the vote, the problem is to get people to act on the vote. They are important weapons if we can show the public that the entire international community agrees on how to resolve the conflict, it's a powerful weapon in our hands. But within the inner sanctums of the General Assembly or the Security Council, nothing is going to happen. It's a very simple principle. Uh, everybody here knows it. Brown versus Topeka, they passed a Supreme, Court, a Supreme Court decision. But the Supreme Court decision was never practically implemented until a mass movement developed which used that powerful weapon of Brown versus the Board of Education in order to force the breakdown of segregation. Those resolutions, or in the case of our own country, the Supreme Court decision was important, but even in our own country, it was not self-enforcing. It required us, not me literally, but the American people, in particular African Americans, to force its implementation. Yes. Mike? Mike, check your question. Oh. Oh, you're for, for me? Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, Where do I stand here and how? I yeah. think the easiest Mike, thing. I check your question. Just okay, Mike right. Your question. I recall being in New York City. In I the, recall I being in New York, York City. City. In, the, in the 1960s on a, in Harlem. In the, in the 1960s, 1960s in Harlem. Harlem. And I heard a speech made by Martin Luther King's brother. And I heard a speech made by Martin Luther King's brother. Which was an appeal for nonviolence. Which was the and as soon as he was finished, Malcolm X stood up at the mic and said, the biggest thing we have to beware of is these Uncle Tom preachers. One more sentence. We have just heard a plea for moderation and reasonable politics. And the whole strength of this movement is its rejection of normal politics and its and its, its elevation of the imagination and revolutionary politics. And your question. My question is how do you reconcile this performance with the revolutionary spirit of this movement? Uh, it's always strange for me to hear that I'm not a, a person of the political left and somehow I'm now a voice of moderation and reason. I, sometimes I wish it were the case I would still be teaching if it were true. I don't know where you inferred from what I said that I was calling for moderation other than to simply hurl a slogan and an epithet as a kind of posturing, which I don't think is particularly useful. What I said was every step of the way we should be careful that we're not losing the public and that we are drawing in more and more people and building a genuinely mass movement. 
that has nothing to do with being moderate. It has to do with being political. Question. This, this gentleman. Question. Mike. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I wanted to get back to your statement. I wanted, I wanted to, to get, get back, back to your statement, statement. Uh, about talking only in terms of what people are ready to do. About talking about what people are ready to do. My question is, what is it that binds people together? My question, My question is, is, what is, it what is it that binds people together? If not a vision of something more than what's immediately possible. Right. Not a vision that was more than something more than immediately possible. Thank you. Sometimes I think the capacity for human communication is much more limited than I would like to believe. <laughs> if it were true, and there's no reason to doubt that it might be true, if it were true that large masses of people were ready to be moved by a much grander vision of a completely radicalized society, then of course, of course, the movement should put that forth as a goal. Nobody said that you should curb, rein in, or put a check on people's dreams and aspirations. The question simply is, how far do those aspirations and dreams go, and how far are, will, are people willing to act on it? That's all I said. And I frankly admitted I'm no saint, but I certainly think I'm on par in my morality with most people in this country. If the, this movement suddenly were to advocate, and I'm not saying you are, but if you were suddenly to advocate, everybody with a spare room in their apartment has to open up their house to the homeless, you'd lose me. And I think you'd lose most people. And that's all I was saying, to be careful that you don't become a cult. And that's a problem that I think has burdened a large part of the left, at least in my recollection. Any more questions? Uh, what do you think, what do you what think, do you think about, about the difference, about the difference, difference between civil disobedience, between civil civil disobedience, disobedience and passive resistance? And passive, and passive resistance. resistance. Yeah. Yeah. Now you start getting in, what's the difference between civil disobedience and passive resistance? Uh, these become quite subtle lingu linguistic questions, which frankly, as a matter of politics, they don't have much substantial difference. So if you take somebody like Gandhi, he always said, I'm against any form of coercion. Anything that's coercive is violent. In fact, he said lying was violent. Uh, shaming people is violent. Anything that had any tinge of coerciveness, he called violent. Okay. But then, if you read the other side of Gandhi, He's always talking about how the workers have to organize, how the peasants have to organize in order to get the capitalists and the landowners to be reasonable. Well, he's effect telling them to use their power in order to force the landlords and capitalists to be reasonable. That's coercion. That's obviously coercion. And people used to say to Mr. Gandhi that he was the most coercive person at all. Because for those of you in the, uh, here who have a child, if a child threatens to jump out the window unless he gets his allowance, that's a kind of psychological terror, right? Well, parents agree that's very coercive, especially if the child is standing right at the edge of the windowsill ready to jump. Well, people said, 
Gandhi carried on just like that child. Every time he didn't get his way, he threatened to die. He says, I'm going to go on a hunger strike until I die. And people said, that's very coercive. In fact, I think an argument, if we start playing the linguistic game, an argument could be made, yes, he was very coercive. The British said, every time Gandhi threatens to die, he's coercing us. Because if he dies, all of India is going to erupt into a, uh, uh, a riot. So you could call it coercion. I mean, it's a paradox, but the ultimate form of nonviolent resistance, namely a fast until the death, can also be conceived legitimately as a form of coercion and even ultimately a form of violence, or at least threatening to unleash violence. So I try not to get into these distinctions of passive nonviolence versus civil disobedience because I think in substance, uh, they don't really make that much difference. Unfortunately, we've run out of time for any more questions. Thank you everyone for coming. If we could just take a temperature check on tonight's uh, talk. Temperature check. Yeah. Anyone who has suggestions for FSU, send it to FSU at OccupyBoston.org. Thank you. Thank you.